All right, so thank you again for joining us for the Introduction to Mentoring, a Guide for Mentors and Mentees workshop this morning. Joining us today is Dr. Rochelle Hines, Associate Professor, Environmental and Occupational Health. So Dr. Hines is going to guide us in developing an understanding of mentorship role dynamics, strategies for effective communication, and practical skills for building impactful partnerships. That all being said, I will go ahead and hand it over to you, Dr. Hines. Great, thanks so much. And um, I really appreciate you guys having me here. This is again, a really uh, important topic to me. So I'm so excited to talk to you all about it. Um, I have a few slides to share, um, but you know, again, my focus is on the workshop style. So hopefully we're gonna have some discussion, comments and questions, please feel free to interrupt. I didn't make too many slides. I don't want that to be the focus. Um, so please chime in. And then afterward, I'm also going to share some um, information, some uh, like a little packet of different exercises, some links and the things that we'll be going over so that you can use those tools afterward. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share some slides and then we'll get going. So obviously, as was mentioned, the topic here today is an introduction to mentoring. And it's, you know, the title said Guide for Mentors and Mentees, but I thought that mostly it would be mentees here. So again, a lot of it is gonna be geared for um, you guys, but eventually someday you're gonna be mentors as you continue um, moving on up. And some of you may already be mentoring undergraduate students and engaging in some of these practices, um, which, I mean, it's fantastic. Holistic mentoring, that um, style of mentoring where you're both receiving mentorship and providing mentorship is um, amazing for your development. And I just realized I dressed to match my slides today. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> All right. So uh, as was mentioned again, my name is Rochelle Hines. Um, my training is actually in neuroscience and I work in the Department of Psychology. I got my PhD in neuroscience. I'm Canadian, you can probably still uh, hear my Canadian accent. It has not worn off despite living in the US for more than 15 years. Um, so I did my undergraduate degree in Southern Alberta. So if you draw a line straight up from where we are now, that's um, where I lived right across the border from Montana. And I was lucky to have a lot of really inspiring mentors there. Um, my main mentor was Jeff Klein, but I received a lot of mentorship from these two people, Ian Wishaw and Brian Cole. And one of the first things that um, um, Ian ever said to me was, uh, do you know what your problem is? So our first conversation started out with um, sort of an affront. It was a bit intense. But looking back, I see that conversation as being probably one of the most formative conversations that I've had in my entire career. Um, during my PhD, I was still in Canada. I worked at the University of British Columbia. My main mentor was Ala El Husseini. And unfortunately, toward the end of my PhD, he tragically passed away. And so I ended up with a second mentor, which um, turned out to be an amazing thing anyways, because I got to learn skills from another person. And then I also had sort of a tough mentor there, um, who gave me a lot of really critical feedback that was important for my growth. Then after that, I did a postdoctoral fellowship in Boston at Tufts University School of Medicine. And my main mentor was Stephen Moss. But I received a lot of mentorship from young faculty members there, Jamie McGuire and Mirabel Rios. And they really shaped um, the way that I started thinking about my own research program, the way I wanted to run my own lab, and, um, you know, as you can see, the type of mentoring I was receiving changed over time, too. And when I started picking my mentors more and more, I started picking people with specific things in mind. And um, that'll be something that we talk about it as well. And I'm still continuing to receive mentorship. I've been a faculty member at UNLV for eight years already. I'm an associate professor. I've been granted tenure, but I still need mentors. I still need mentorship. And so I'm still collecting amazing people um, to help me. So uh, VPR a few years ago was Mary Krogan and she actually spent a lot of time with me providing me with feedback and advice on um, career traje trajectory. I have a new collaborator 
that's a little more senior than me and he's acting as a mentor. And I just collected a new mentor, Dr. Brenda Bloodgood, who's mentoring me on a, a training grant that I just submitted and she has one right now and it's been really helpful. So, you know, I'm still collecting people. Um, so that can tell you a little bit about how important I think this process is. So what are we going to try to do today? We're going to try to learn about the difference between mentor and mentee roles and how they really work together. And we're going to discover communication strategies that are very, very effective. And a lot of this communication actually starts with knowing yourself better. So we're going to talk a lot about that, knowing your own expectations, knowing your boundaries, knowing your goals, seeing your reality. We're going to talk about that one a lot because incredibly, uh, it's hard to see our own reality sometimes. And then we're going to work on learning um, some effective approaches for some of these things. So as I said, there's going to be some tools and different things that we go through a little bit. And um, again, those will be shared afterward. Um, but we're going to look at you know, very specific and concrete strategies, things that you can do, exercises and activities, um, so that um, you can kind of have a more clear picture of what some of these things involve. So mentor-mentee relationships are actually complex. It's sort of incredible. <laughs> you start off your PhD and you form a long-term relationship with somebody that you maybe don't even know that much about. Often you're moving um, to a new city. Sometimes you've maybe even never met the person um, in person. And so, um, you know, this is a brave step, just sort of stepping out there into this relationship and, um, you know, getting started. And of course, these mentor-mentee relationships are meant to be, mutu meant to be mutually beneficial. And um, both people on both sides are going to have goals and expectations. And so it's really a two-way um, relationship. And both the mentor and mentee have really important responsibilities in this relationship. So as a mentee, your responsibilities are to engage in the learning. You know, part of doing a PhD is really being here to learn, being here to grow, showing initiative, showing that you're motivated, you want to own your own PhD, you want to run the show. Um, following through on feedback that you receive. So often when people provide you with feedback, you know, they're looking to see some sort of specific change. And so following through on that change and making those things happen. Um, re accepting responsibility, accepting responsibility for your project and the progress. And, you know, accept responsibility for both the things that are going great and the things that aren't going so great. Sometimes we tend to say all the problems are ours, but all the successes are somebody else's. And we really have to flip that mentality. So all the successes are yours, but so are all the snags and all the problems. And accepting both of those wholeheartedly is uh, very helpful. And also, it's sort of on you a little bit as a mentee to manage the relationship. Um, but again, that's not a burden. That gives you agency and um, a driver's seat position in this relationship, which is again, very important. As a mentor, um, they're responsible for helping you develop their capab your capabilities, for providing you with instruction or providing you with the resources or people that can provide you the instruction. Hopefully they're at least a little bit inspirational. You probably wouldn't have picked to work with them if they weren't. And they are meant to provide feedback. That's like literally their, one of their major jobs. But sometimes feedback is challenging. We're gonna talk about that. And um, again, another responsibility they might have is opening doors for you, connecting you with other people, um, connecting you with professional societies or other mentors, maybe even um, collaborators. Uh, things like that, helping you get to meetings, to engage in networking. And of course, there's a lot of overlap between the mentor and the mentee that, you know, both really share responsibility in. And this includes listening, listening actively, building trust with one another. It has to be a trusting relationship, and that's something we're going to talk about more. 
um, being able to critically examine the current reality. And I'm going to talk about seeing reality a lot. I'm a neuroscientist. I, I think about how the brain works, but it's amazing. Our brains are not very good at seeing reality. And then identifying goals. Um, you know, again, hopefully you and your mentor have mutual goals. You can identify them and work on them together. That's when the situations are most productive. And then also be prepared to iterate. So iterating is, you know, essentially this continuous cycle that you're in as a graduate student. You're constantly revising your work, making refinements, and bringing it back in again. And this in particular, I think, is a massive shift from being an undergraduate. In your undergraduate, you write that perfect term paper, you turn it in, and you're done. In graduate school, be prepared to turn it in, get feedback, fix it, turn it in again, get more feedback, fix it again, turn it back in. And really, that's... Um, uh, such a beautiful but painful part of the process of growth during graduate school is just this constant iteration. We are constantly um, becoming our better selves. So the roles and responsibilities might differ with different relationships. And so this might not match up exactly for your mentor-mentee relationship, and that's absolutely fine. And they're also flexible over time. So as you develop new skills and, you know, change your perspectives, you know, you might want to change the way that this relationship is structured and which, which responsibilities you're taking on and what sorts of things your mentor can do for you. Um, one very common theme that we're going to talk about a good bit today is communication. And establishing a strong relationship requires communication. We need to communicate about our expectations. What do we want out of the mentor-mentee relationship? But also, what do we bring? What can our mentor expect to get from us in return? And then we also sometimes need to communicate about boundaries. And uh, this can often be uh, very scary because there is, unfortunately, this sort of um, power dynamic or dimension that we can often feel in these relationships. Although, again, the goal is to not have them be hierarchical, there is that perception, and that's hard to break down. Um, but again, at times you may need to communicate about boundaries, um, especially um, to help, um, you know, protect um, certain aspects of your priorities. So communicating on expectations and boundaries, I think that's a really great place to start. Um, again, if we don't communicate with people about what we want, it's going to be extremely difficult for them to try to provide it. And so again, it's it's really critical that you are able to communicate with your mentor what your expectations are. And again, the same thing is true with boundaries. If somebody doesn't know that they've come close on a boundary or um, that you are not um, okay with a certain behavior or a certain situation, then they're going to continue to engage in that behavior or create that situation. And so what are some examples of expectations? Um, so a mentor might say something like, I expect a quick turnaround on emails as we head toward this grant deadline. And that is not the mentor telling you you're too slow, but is, that's the mentor expressing probably some anxiety about the upcoming grant deadline and looking for somebody to be on their team. Another one might be, I expect that we can meet at least twice a month to discuss prog progress on this project. Um, some mentors will want to meet with you once a week. Some mentors, you'll have to encourage them to meet. And again, everyone is different, and we need to understand both what is reasonable for ourselves, what expectations do we have there, and what is coming from the other side, and try to find that middle ground where you know, you're getting your needs met, but also it's reasonable for um, the other person. Um, another possible expectation might be, I expect that the revisions on this figure for the manuscript be ready by the end of the week. And again, that, that's not um, the mentor saying, you're too slow, or make sure you get it done, or you need to work harder. That's the, the, the mentor communicating that we need to get this done by this certain point. There's a pressure in this situation, and we're trying to get it done so that we can get this manuscript res resubmitted or something um, some important examples of boundaries, and again, boundaries can be extremely important. Um, one example might be, I'll address any evening emails first thing the following morning. 
I have family responsibilities or I don't do email in the evening, but I'll be on it first thing the next morning. I'm not available to take in-person meetings on the weekends. That's a, a, personal, a personal boundary that you may want to make. Um, if somebody is you know, asking you for time on the weekends that you're not comfortable with. Um, and, you know, again, in parallel with this, I need the revisions by the end of the week. Well, you might, in response to that sort of expectation, say something like, well, in order to complete this task by the end of the week, I need a little bit of guidance on X, Y, Z, or I might need support from this person on ABC. Yeah, and so, again, in response to an expectation, you can sometimes communicate a boundary that lets the other person know, well, yes, I'm going to work on that, but these are the supports I think I might need. And again, it's really a two-way conversation, and finding that middle ground and communicating around it is very important. So there's a really important element here, which is that um, people really need to feel safe in order to communicate clearly and share expectations and boundaries. So these mentor-mentee relationships, they're built on trust. And again, you can almost think about them as long-term relationships. So, you know, the behaviors and attitudes that you bring to these relationships are going to be very similar to the behaviors and attitudes that you use to interact with members of your family or um, you know, very close um, friendships, because again, they're really built on this ability to communicate with one another clearly. And we can often have disappointments in mentor-mentee relationships. And if we do face disappointments, again, they're very common. Um, it's important to be able to communicate about them. So mentees need to feel that it's acceptable to communicate if something is not working for them. But mentors are also going to communicate in that way, too. They're going to need to be able to communicate with you and say, this did not meet my expectations. And again, sometimes that type of feedback is really challenging. It's hard to deal with. Um, and it can at times feel personer, personal, um, but it shouldn't be or, you know, really isn't, um, again, if the mentor has um, got the right framework for their own behavior. And so, again, you can expect to both receive a lot of critical feedback. That's part of your growth. But there are cases where you may need to provide some feedback and communicate your expectations, boundaries, and needs in return. And again, that's going to require sometimes some bravery and some trust in the relationship. Um, I already have mentioned briefly that we were going to talk a good bit about seeing reality and how hard this is. But these are a few realities that I think are very informative in setting your expectations for um, your graduate training. So the one that I tell my trainees all the time, and I think they probably get tired of hearing it, is this is meant to be hard. Not just for the sake of being hard, but it's meant to be hard because that's where the value comes. Um, when you are doing hard things, you're growing, you're changing, you're stretching yourself. And there's going to be discomfort with all of that. And so, you know, I try to help my mentors or my mentees see that, you know, when you're uncomfortable, that's that's okay. That's a good sign. You're that means you're growing. You're ready to have that growth spurt and be into this next stage. And again, if you're comfortable the entire time, you're maybe not getting your value out. You're maybe not getting the experience and the development that you need from your um, graduate program. Another reality about doing graduate training is you're creating new knowledge. You're out there, you know, somewhere on your own maybe, and you're trying to create some kernel or some gem of new knowledge that, you know, when you finish your dissertation, this is what you share with the world, uh, which is amazing. But that also means there's many unknowns and you're sometimes going to feel like you're out there on your own or you're in the weeds and it's confusing. You feel lost. I had a trainee in my office just the other day. Well, I feel lost and I, you know, I don't have many skills in this area, but again, it's important to remember that's, that's a part of the process and that sort of growth um, is why you're here. And you know, I always tell my trainees too, well, I, I wasn't born to be a neuroscientist. I actually started off in education. I was thought I was going to 
do special education. When I started neuroscience, I didn't even know what neuroscience was. I took a class called Brain and Behavior because I thought it would teach me about the brain in those developmental and learning disorders that I was, you know, working with. And, you know, I, I didn't even know neuroscience was a field. I didn't even know, you know, how it was made up. But again, right away, I did recognize that it was fascinating and I wanted to know more. So a lot of times you feel like you're out there all alone and you're the only one that's been out there, um, you know, by yourself with no skills. But, you know, we all started off uh, in that uncomfortable space and uh, growing from there uh, is amazing. And then one other reality is that mentors have responsibilities and goals and they love mentoring you. That's why they do it. Um, but mentoring is a part of their agenda. They are working toward certain things. They are working toward publishing papers, maybe getting grants, maybe maybe getting promoted to associate professor and getting tenure. And so again, they, they care about you, they love mentoring you, but it is one part of a big um, cosmos for them. And so again, they're trying to balance many things. And so if they're communicating priorities or deadlines, you know, it's not personal again. And I think it's hard to see um, that reality is that it's about the situation, not about you or them even, really. All right, are there any questions so far? Is there anything that anybody's wondering about or wanting to know more about? All right, we'll keep on forging ahead. All right, so we talked a little bit about these different things that mentors might provide. A mentor might provide support and hopefully they're accessible and approachable. You feel okay to talk with them. They're gonna invest time in you. And again, that's a big investment because they're splitting their time between many competing demands. You know, most of our faculty members, they're teaching a good bit, they're doing research themselves, they're providing mentorship, they're writing grants, they're writing papers. And so they often have this sort of divided attention and getting their time is, um, is great. And you'll have to sometimes work to get it. And again, hopefully they should inspire you. They may also provide instruction directly. They might show you exactly how to do something in the lab. They might recommend resources for you so you can gain that instruction, or they might enlist a peer or a junior mentor that um, can help you out um, in developing a skill. They provide sponsorship. Um, again, they can create opportunities for you to attend conferences or meetings and open doors for you so that you can make a new connection and build out your network or you know, um, when you're applying for your postdoc, if you're going to do a postdoc or your job, you know, they're going to help you with those processes and they're going to write you amazing letters of recommendation. Um, the more itchy stuff, the stuff that's tougher is they're going to intervene. They need to intervene if there's a problem. Um, they need to identify those problems in the first place. They need to address them. And, um, you know, again, sometimes that stuff feels hard. It feels hard to receive um, feedback. And then they're going to critique you. They're going to tell you those hard things. They're going to tell you what you need to do to grow. Um, they're going to give you recommendations. And again, some of this stuff feels hard. But a lot of times, if you have a mentor that's, you know, just doing the fluffy stuff, you're not getting that growth out. And if you have a mentor that's just doing the tough stuff, then you're not getting that sort of nurturing and support that you need. And it is very challenging for one mentor to do all of these things. So in the spirit of Koi Laray, mentors as people too, they have problems. They are not always great at doing all of these things, especially at the same time. And so, you know, again, that's, that's another thing to acknowledge. It's just um, humanity. Um, and so, one mentor might not be able to meet all of these needs for you, and that's okay. Um, but you can look at what your mentor is providing and then figure out how to balance the rest of that out. So this brings us to this idea about making a mentor network. And so even as faculty members, this is a very highly recommended method for um, getting our mentorship. Oops, something happened with my slide there. Um, so Again, often we can't really just sit there and wish that we had this one guru who could do all the things for us. Um, 
Instead, we sort of need to take agency for ourselves and, and really start to ask ourselves, well, what is it that I actually need? What, what am I not getting out of this sort of balance between the tough stuff and the easy stuff? Um, and then where would be a place that I could potentially get that? And again, this really shifts you from being dependent on this one person to try to, you know, meet your needs, probably not entirely, to being empowered to create a, a learning situation that really suits um, you and your priorities. So again, here we might have our mentee in the center, and they might be getting a lot of intervention and critique from their main mentor. And again, some mentors do a lot of this stuff and not a lot of the other stuff. And so maybe they may decide that they need to find some um, other mentors that can provide them with more of those sort of supportive skills. They can um, be a great listener and allow them to vent and also, you know, give them that inspiration and give them that, um, you know, more supportive environment. Um, so that's something that we're going to look at next. So again, a lot of mentoring relationships are dyads. We have one mentor and one mentee, and then it just sort of goes back and forth like this. But again, this is not an ideal relationship. Um, so we really need to think about other types of models that we can use. Um, and I really like the network model. In our lab, we use a learning organization model. So um, myself and the other major um, leader, the other Dr. Hines, there's two of us, um, we have um, established you know, core people that have certain competencies. And we put them at the center of a web and then we put people that you know, receive training from those people around them in the web. And so in that way, you know, we're not the only ones that can dispense knowledge. You know, we rely a lot on our senior lab people to, you know, be sources of knowledge for our whole organization. And we help to develop those people's skills so that they can now be dispensers of knowledge and other people can come to them. Of course, we are still here if there are problems, but it really helps distribute that, you know, um, representation of knowledge throughout the network. And again, a network model is really, really good because you can define different nodes um, or different spots where you're seeking you know, very different and very specific things. And there are a bunch of tools to help you do this online. That's one thing that we can look at next. Uh, actually, I'll come back to that. So this is um, one of those tools. It's from the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity. So this is meant for faculty members. It may be a little overwhelming because there's a whole bunch of stuff here. I don't think I could gather this many mentors if I worked on it for weeks. So don't get overwhelmed by that. But what it will do is to try to give you this structure where, you know, well, what really matters to you? Uh, what do you need? What are you currently getting? And try to fill in some of these um, boxes. So of course you need substantive feedback. Again, a lot of us are getting a lot of this, but not so much of the other stuff. So we might need to fill out some of these other areas. Um, so we might be looking for emotional support. And again, that can be family members and friends, but just knowing, okay, these are, these are my people when I need this. This is where I should spend some time, or these are connections I need to make more of. Um, we also need access to opportunities like we've been talking about. And sometimes this can be, again, mentors who help you attend a specific conference, but sometimes it's just a peer too, and they let you know about other grant opportunities that they're applying for or award opportunities. And you might share materials on courses that you're taking together um, to give you the opportunity to be more successful in the class. Um, we also need role models. Again, these are really gonna be the sort of more inspirational people. Um, and sometimes you have these people as mentors and they don't even know you're uh, using them as a mentor, but they're inspiring you. They're giving you that, um, you know, target to aim for. So again, filling this out to at least some extent can be really helpful. And it helps you understand, you know, who are the people that I can count on for different things? Because again, it's going to be really challenging in a dyad to get all of your needs met. Um, 
So the thing that I want to go back to here is this worksheet. It comes from a great mentoring or great mentoring in graduate school, a quick start guide for protégés. And this is developed by um, another university, but I really liked their checklist because I think what it helps you do is to rank these priorities. You know, there might be some of these things that are not that important to you. So maybe you don't need to seek a mentor for that, but maybe some of them are very important and maybe you don't even know yet um, what those things are. And that's totally okay. But until you sort of think through each of these different things, it's hard to say like, how important is that to me? Or is that a factor for me? So here on category one, we're looking at different types of career support you might um, get from a mentor. And then on the right-hand side, we have psychosocial or relationship support. So sometimes we just need to feel liked or believed in. And again, that might be hard to balance with a person that's also providing you with critical feedback. And so if you have a lot of critical feedback from your main mentor, you may really want to seek out people that give you this sense like, you're doing great. You're doing awesome. Like, Keep going. Um, we all need to have those sort of like hype people in our lives. And so, again, you can recognize sometimes that if that's the thing that you're missing, you know, those are the specific people that you want to seek out. And so, again, this will be in the packet um, so that you can kind of work through this activity and get a sense of, you know, what are really important aspects for you. So what are your goals? Well, obviously we all uh, enter into graduate training to get that, um, to do that walk, to get that piece of paper. Um, but again, if we focus just on that, it's extremely hard to get there. And so a lot of times we're gonna have to break down our goals into something much smaller. So you know, again, we, we want to graduate, we want to finish, um, but we really have to work backwards from that um, and break it down into really smaller pieces that are more manageable and achievable. So that's one thing that we're going to spend some time on next. So in our relationships, it's really important that we have some alignment on our goals. And again, that's really helpful because if we're all headed somewhere together, um, it's going to make it a lot easier <laughs> instead of, if, you know, one's pulling in one sort of direction and one's pulling in another. And that doesn't mean you have to have the same goals as your mentor. Often you won't. And often you won't even want the same career path as your mentor. You want to do something else. Again, that is perfectly okay. But in most cases, you can think about, well, what our mentors trying to do? What am I trying to do? And what are the common ways that we can work on those mutual goals together? So mentor goals might include things like continuing to develop their own skills. Again, as I said, I'm still collecting mentors. I'm still trying to learn. I'm still trying to become a better neuroscientist, even though I've been a faculty member for eight years. Um, mentors are engaging in career planning. They're looking at their next steps. Um, they're um, still gaining visibility in their field. They're still um, wanting to get tenure sometimes and promotion. And so all of these things, again, are, are sort of major drivers for faculty mentors. And of course, mentees also want to grow leadership skills. So there's like some overlap there. And you can learn a lot from watching how they lead their research organization or their creative organization. Um, you want to um, strengthen emotional intelligence and communication skills as a mentee. Again, that's a major goal. And really learning about relationships and navigating difficult situations, again, that's going to be a massive thing that you take away from your um, graduate training. Um, you know, solving hard problems. That's probably one of the biggest things um, that, that you do take away. Uh, and again, that's why it has value because you know how to manage these really challenging um, situations. And so, you know, sometimes I joke with trainees and, and I say like, you'll be in the grocery store and, and, you know, something will go wrong in the line and you'll automatically start solving that problem because you're so steeped in this, way of thinking about problems and thinking about the world differently. Um, but again, that's not easy. It takes a lot of effort. And so, you know, again, start to think about, well, what are some of the things that my mentor is 
um, really working on? And how does that align with some of the same things that I want to achieve? You probably want to publish your papers too, or, um, you know, again, produce your creative works. So, uh, you know, again, that's a, an easy thing to align on because that's great for both of you. So as I already mentioned, it's really tough when you have like this massive goal and you don't know how to break into it, you know, get a PhD or write my dissertation. Again, those are so massive. You know, whenever anybody says, well, I'm, I'm writing, I always get worried about them <laughs> because that's not specific enough. So let's talk for a minute about setting SMART goals, um, because again, that can really help us break down problems. So SMART is an acronym that stands for specific. Your goals need to be very specific. You need to know exactly what you're writing, if that's the example. What you're writing, how long is it, when is it due, all of these specifics. You need to have those Ws. And it helps if when we are working on our goals, we use action words. So what steps can you take? Um, and again, that's really important because if it doesn't have an action in it, it's hard to get going. Our goals should also be measurable. And um, again, I'm writing is tough because how, how are you going to know when you're done writing? Are you going to write forever? Or what are you trying to write? And, and when are you going to know that it's done? Well, I'm, I am writing the first paragraph of the introduction on my paper about whatever, right? So you can see how we're getting a lot more specific already by just saying, okay, it's gonna be one paragraph. That's my goal for today. And I am writing, that's an action. And I know exactly what it's about and what part of the overall manuscript it is. A stands for attainable. And attainable is really important. This should be things that are just manageably difficult, challenging, but possible. And so again, you don't wanna set yourself up for this expectation that's not going to be met. You really wanna make it possible for you to achieve. And it should be realistic. Again, we're talking about seeing reality. You need to know your capabilities and you also need to predict potential hurdles or barriers that you might face. And again, a lot of times if we can predict those hurdles and barriers, we can figure out exactly what we're gonna do when we come up against them. And then they don't sort of blindside us so much. We can make more progress. And they should be time-based. So again, you know, by the time I wanna graduate, is it really enough? Pick a small goal and figure out when that goal should be done and try to manage it. Once you've picked that goal, you have to often plan backward because you can sometimes break it down either even further from then, from there. So if your mentor says, okay, I want this feedback on or this revision on Friday, you might be able to break it down and say, okay, well, that involves generating this new graph, that involves running the statistics on that graph, that involves this aspect and this aspect. And so, you know, you can set little timelines inside there working backwards from when the whole thing needs to be done. And again, really making sure that when we set a goal, it has these aspects involved um, is critically important. And there's a little worksheet on creating SMART goals um, in the information that I'll share. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. I've been trying to make this not too science-y because again, I anticipated that there might be people from all kinds of different disciplines. This one is science focused, but inside this tool, there are things that I think are broadly applicable. And I couldn't find an equivalent for other types of career paths. Um, but this is a tool I actually discovered very, very recently. I wish I had known about it before. And it's developed by uh, science publishers and it's in the science careers subsection. And it's called My IDP. Um, the, the web address is here, but again, it's gonna be in the materials that I share afterward. And again, this really is helpful for getting you out of the weeds, helping you see some possible paths. And this is really important, again, if you think you may not want to follow the exact path 
that your mentor is on. You know, mentors should not be trying to create like many themselves over and over and over again. They're trying to nurture you to get you where you want to go. But if you don't know where you want to go, then it's hard for them to help you. And so that's what this tool is really about, is helping you figure out, well, where is it exactly that I want to go and, and what would I be well suited for? And so here's just a peek inside to give you some information. So you can create an account, it's free. And then um, you there's an overview, so you understand all the different parts. You enter some personal information. Then it goes through a skills assessment. And again, a lot of this is very science-based. So for some of you, it may not be applicable. And again, apologies, I couldn't find an equivalent for other disciplines, but maybe they're out there and I'm just not aware of them. And then an interests assessment. So, you know, what sorts of things do you want to do? And values, because again, aligning the things that we want to do with our values is also very important for our satisfaction. So if we have skills in a certain area, but it doesn't align with our values, maybe we need to develop more skills so that we can get that value alignment that, again, is really important for how you feel about your career. And then there's a whole section on career exploration, um, looking at uh, different types of careers and their fit, um, reading about different careers, some events that you might be able to attend to learn more, um, and you know, eventually gets you down to choosing some prospective career paths. And then once you have that path, it helps you create a plan. So what are your goals for career advancement? What are your goals for gaining new skills? And what are your project goals? Um, and then implementing the plan. So how do you start taking those active steps um, so that you can achieve your goals? Again, for science careers, it's incredibly comprehensive and very, very helpful. Um, so if you're in a science discipline, definitely um, it's a tool I would start to use. And even if you're not in a science discipline, you might still get enough structure from it um, that it's beneficial. Is anyone aware of a similar type of thing for non-STEM based um, pathways? All right. But again, this will be in the packet. And again, it's free to create. So there might be a few things that you could explore around there, even if it's not a perfect fit for you. So then you make this individual development plan. You probably have to have a meeting to talk about it. So how to make meetings work better? You probably have to have a lot of meetings with your mentor. And um, meetings are sort of uh, a big time waster sometimes if we don't have sort of our goals and our agenda and our plan in mind. And often you have to repeat a meeting that you've already had because you didn't get from it what you actually needed. And that sucks too. So uh, here's some tips for, you know, you're, you're gonna have a meeting. What, how should you set that up? Well, of course you should be prepared. You should know your goals or um, maybe some front burner issues. What are the most urgent things that I need to have addressed? And at the same time, you sort of have to anticipate mentors goals um, and figure out you know, what do they want to have happen by the end of this meeting and bring materials. Um, that's one of the things that we first work on mentees with is if you come to a meeting and you don't have something to show, it's very hard to get a lot of progress. So if you're working on a figure for a manuscript, you know, print out what you have and we'll talk through it and write, mark it up and then um, then you know what to do next. But if you just have like a blank paper, um, it's hard to make that structure so that you can truly advance. There should be an agenda. About 70% of time in meetings is misused. Um, so again, meetings are known as a big time waster. So have an agenda, have a plan of what it should look like and share that and keep it clear and concise. Build rapport. So good communication. We've been talking a little bit about this already. It involves good listening, showing you're invested, being authentic, being honest. And again, these things are all important for building and maintaining that trust in your relationship with your mentor. Uh, try to under promise and over deliver. So this again goes back to goals and set them so that they're readily achievable and then deliver on those promises. Uh, I think a lot of mentees feel like they have to make a big promise, but then it's challenging for them to meet that. It's actually better if you make a smaller promise and definitely get it done and then make another small promise and definitely get it done. So try to 
break down those goals a little bit more so that you can communicate, okay, I'm going to do this, this, this smaller thing rather than promise the really big thing and then not make it there. Um, ask questions. So you need to be sure that you understand how to meet any goals or expectations and take time to recap. So sometimes you can recap the meeting and say, okay, from my understanding, these are the three action items that I need. And again, that recap can be really important. Maybe you've missed something. Maybe you've got the wrong priority. They expressed a different priority and you didn't really catch that. So that recap can be really important. And then try to meet up as regularly as possible. You can sometimes plan and schedule the next meeting when you're leaving the first one. And these regular check-ins are really important for keeping the relationship you know, open and free for communication and keeping your progress on your project very healthy. Um, one set of tips for communication involves the observation impact action style of communication. So here's a great example. Instead of just saying, hey, I really liked your presentation today, you might say your presentation, presentation today was great. Since last week's meeting, you added an, the example of X for a more concrete way to share the context, which made it easier to relate to the situation and understand your proposal. I hope you can keep testing out new ideas in the future. So again, when we're more specific like this in our communication and we communicate the things that have went wrong, what our goals are, we can often achieve a lot more. We will run into challenging conversations. Um, and so we may need some guidance in how to manage that. It's, it's very likely to happen. These relationships are loaded because there's you know, so many expectations and goals. So again, you need to know your motive for engaging in the conversation. Understand what you desire um, the outcome to be and sort of make sure you see that clearly first. Again, it's important to approach the conversation from an element of trust. You're going to have to trust that the conversation is you know, set up for success and trust that the other person um, is gonna be there to engage in that conversation with you. And then you can apply that observation or situation observation impact action framework to make sure that the, the conversation is productive. So here is the situation that I found challenging I observed that it affected, it had this impact on me. And, you know, I think this is an action that we can take going forward in the future. Um, the next step is to also keep in mind the power of questions. So you can always pose questions when things are not clear. It can give you a lot more clarity um, to understand the other person's perspective. And then the last one is to be open to change. Again, sometimes these difficult challenging conversations arise when someone is pushing us to make a change and we're feeling a resistance from inside ourselves. And so again, being open to that change um, can be extremely important. So just to summarize, um, collect amazing people and often you need more than one. Know your expectations, boundaries and goals. And again, there'll be some um, items for you to, have to work on some of those things. Work on seeing your reality, know your strengths and know your limitations. And everybody has both. Um, you might consider building a mentor network because again, everybody has both. Your mentor is going to have some awesome strengths and some weaknesses. And so if you reach out to more people, you can get more support. Consider creating an individualized development plan or an IDP. And again, I shared that tool for scientists but there are um, you know, some common threads in there that may be helpful. And then once you have this IDP, discuss it with your mentors. Um, I gave some tips for structuring meetings to make them work for you. And also how to use the impact observation action communication style to get more out of your communications. And I'd be happy to take any questions with the time that we have left. Please feel welcome to unmute yourself if you want to pose a question or type it in the chat. Um, I guess this is Margo. My, my question is just how do you go about getting a mentor? Do you just go and ask someone to be your mentor? Um, how, yeah, do you, how do you do it? Especially, question. you know, you're building a network. Yes, absolutely. Um, so that's a great question because, again, sometimes it can be intimidating. And I, so I can share what I do. I usually don't say, hey, can you be my mentor? Because 
again, that is a big ask sometimes, especially for busy people. Um, often what I do is I use that sort of specificity framework. I try to ask them specifically for what I need. So I mentioned um, that I just collected a new mentor. And I collected this mentor because I'm working on a research education grant. Um, and I thought, well, I don't even know how to write one of these. Maybe I should see who has one. And so I looked up the NIH grant um, reporter and I looked at people who had them. I looked for people nearby that worked in similar areas like neuroscience. And I picked a few names and I just started going down the list. And actually the first person that I asked was like, yeah, sure, I'd be happy to support you in that. And I'd be happy to serve on your advisory committee. And so again, trying to figure out exactly what it is that you might need from that person and providing that framework to them can, can be really helpful. Because again, if we just say, I want you to be my mentor, they might not understand what that's gonna entail for you. Um, is that helpful, Margo? Yes, thank you. Yeah. And likely you've already been assigned a mentor, you know, that's your sort of supervisor or your direct connect. Um, but again, some of those other relationships, you know, they feel a little more tricky to build. Um, but again, one thing that I've definitely learned is if you're not sure or you're a little nervous, just send that email. And the worst thing that can happen is they'll be like, I'm too busy right now or not reply, right? That's the absolute worst outcome. So you might as well go for it. Give it a try. Wow, I see a question in the chat. So you're, you're being both a mentor and a mentee. The biggest piece of advice for a new mentor, um, listen, 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 listen. Um, and try to recognize who your mentor or mentee is as a person. Um, try to see the parts of them that they're bringing um, into the dynamic. So a big thing that I do when I'm working with a new undergraduate student, for example, is I try to ask them questions and really listen carefully to their answers about what they see as their own amazing strengths and what do they identify as weaknesses? Because in, in our lab, even a neuroscience lab, we have roles for people that are great at math. We have roles for people that struggle with math. We have roles for people that are very detail oriented. We have roles for people that are um, more global thinkers. And so just understanding those strengths and weaknesses and understanding their background and who they are as a person can really help you set them up for success and it makes everything else um, easier. So those are just a few um, small things I can keep talking on that topic. Um, but again, I'm still learning how to be a good mentor, I think. Um, and I mentored a lot of graduate students when I was a postdoc and I've been mentoring students for eight years at UNLV and I still feel like I'm figuring it out. So don't expect a lot from yourself either. You're a human in that relationship too. And, you have to know what your own strengths and weaknesses are too. Any other questions? I'm happy to take questions. I definitely tried to make it not too much clicking through slides. All right, well, um, if there aren't any, any additional questions, uh, just wanna thank everyone who joined us today and especially thank you, Dr. Hines, for sharing your expertise, your time with us. And I will of course pass along those resources that you share after the fact here. Um, Oh, we do have one more question. One more All question. right. Ah, good ways to promote boundaries with mentees. Uh, you know, I think clear communication. Uh, and again, I think that's hard. I think that is definitely challenging. Um, you know, and, and sometimes we might feel like, you know, oh, I just don't want to have that conversation. It's going to be tough. Um, but that's usually when I like try to resolve myself and just like run right at that conversation. Um, because generally in the end, everybody sort of feels better. And it's really important for mentees, if they don't know what the boundaries and expectations are, then they don't know how to operate. And having that transparency and that really clear level of expectation, again, it's it's really, really transformative because again, then they really can start to see, okay, well, these are the benchmarks. This is what I'm trying for. You know, this is a line I shouldn't cross. And again, it's that structure is helpful, even though it feels so hard. It does, it does, it still feels hard for me to have 
a conversation with a mentee that I know is going to be like, look, this is not working. This is a problem or, you know, this is not meeting expectations. Um, those conversations are always hard. Um, but yes, they're so vital and so important. And again, I really reframe it for myself even to say this is critical feedback that this person needs to be the best in this situation. Or this is a critical boundary that this person needs to understand to be their best in this situation. Awesome. Well, thank you all again. It's 11. So um, we'll let you go. If you if you have a moment, please fill out the survey link that I dropped in the chat. Um, we definitely use those to inform our future surveys. So thank you very much. Thank you again. We'll send over those resources in a little bit. Thank you guys all for your attention and questions. Mm -hmm.